Hi, I'm Patrick Scott. Welcome back to our discussion of PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. Uh, in our last segment, we were talking about the Constitution and, and the establishment, the founding of our country. And we began talking about various checks and balances and, and various components that are, and principles that are built into our Constitution. What I want to do now in terms of starting to talk, out, talk uh, and as we continue our discussion of the Constitution, is to uh, describe a little bit of detail about the ideas that were influencing um, the, th the thinking going behind the various components that were con included in our Constitution. And so from this, I want to talk about a little bit of some material that was taken from the Federalist Papers uh, that, uh, again, serves as a very important commentary on the Constitution that was written by uh, uh, Madison, ha Hamilton, and some others. And in, in particular, I want to focus on two of the documents, Federalist number, Paper number 10 and number 51. And let me talk about some of, of Madison's views here. Um, we're talking about checks and balances in our last session. And, uh, you know, why do we have this idea of checks and balances? And, and basically, one of the things that Madison was talking about was that the checks and balances were based upon certain assumptions about human nature. Um, the framers believed that people would uh, be good enough to have, to make it possible to have a free government, um, but at the same time they recognized the tendencies towards self-interest. And to Madison, the way you keep government in check was basically make the government strong enough to carry out its essential f functions, but at the same time allow the self-interest of one person or one group to check the self-interest of another. To Madison, people, he was making the arguments that people who are driven by self-interest will devolve into something that he, he attributed as factions. And factions were basically def defined by Madison as, as, uh, as follows. It's a number of citizens which can be a majority or a minority of people, and they are united by some common passion or interest that is in opposition to the rights of other citizens or the permanent and aggregate interest of the community. And this is taken from Federalist Number 10. This idea of faction is kind of like the idea of an interest group, a little bit broader in, in concept, however. And, but the idea is that people, as they pursue their, 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 their self-interest, are naturally going to form into factions. Now, factions themselves are neither good nor bad, but the problem is that the factions can lead to something called the tyranny of the majority. And this is basically where the rights of the minority are going to be trampled upon by the majority. And he believed that both the minority and minority, uh, majority, depending upon no matter how you, how you define this, but all the groups ought to have basic rights and freedoms. And the way you protect this tyranny of the majority is by dispersing political power so that no one faction could really gain the upper hand. And this could be done through a system of separation of powers and checks and balances. So, by avoiding the concentration of political power, you thus avoid the problem, problems that would inevitably occur with these factions. Uh, factions would have to work together to get things done. Compromise would be the key. Okay, so with this system here, one faction or set of factions may come to no dominate uh, one part of government or one branch, while another set of factions might dominate another branch. But it's the pushing and tugging of these different factions, all right, that would re require and craft compromise, and it would help to ensure, prevent, or prevent any faction from dominating all of government. Okay, so one of the things that Madison was suggesting was that uh, having a system of separation of powers and checks and balances was very, very important to help keep these factions in in, in check. Now. Madison was also arguing along a, a different kind of take here, and that is why, why not only separation of powers, but why also a strong national government? Well, again, can you see tyranny of the majority taking place, not only in terms of the branches, you know, if one, if one uh, uh, faction came to dominate all of government, so you separate those in terms of different branches, but could also, throughout our country, could there be tyranny of the majority taking place in smaller communities, and that's what also he was, fear, he, he was fearful of. Uh, there might be in a small community, for example, one group, a majority, passing laws that would trample upon the rights of a minority, and in the process of doing that, the, the minority views would not be expressed. So by having a strong national government, uh, 
there could be basically an opportunity or a way for that strong national gov gov government to, to control that tendency of tyranny of the majority taking place at, at the, the local level. And so, in a lot of ways here, the, the argument here is that tyranny of the majority could be uh, curtailed by having both a strong national government as well as uh, having separation of powers at, at that level. Now, a related point deals with, uh, with the concept of liberty. And this is the Constitution and liberty. And this involves basically the debate occurring between the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. The Anti-Federalist, people like Jefferson, believe that liberty could be secured best in a small republic where you had a weak national government, where you have basically the rulers who are physically close to where you are, who, and they're checked by, by the citizens, all right? So you have a small, limited national government. More of the power is going to reside at the state and local level. A strong national government could be bad because it would be too distant from the people, and it would use its powers to annihilate or absorb functions that properly belonged to the states. The Anti-Federalists wanted most of the powers of the government to be kept firmly in the hands of the states. Now, Madison, by contrast, and certainly Hamilton as well, argued that liberty is better preserved in a large republic where you have more power reserved at the national level, where there will be many opinions and interest and uh, diversity of, of, of viewpoints. That would be better in terms of preserving liberty than, say, the uniform characteristics of small communities. Again, going back to the idea of small communities where you have a lot of power residing there, you could have a lot of tyranny of the majority, and it's much more easily accomplished in small communities. And so basically, the idea that Madison was saying is that people who lived, who had unpopular viewpoints, who were part of minority factions, uh, th these individuals will find it much easier to acquire allies in a larger and more diverse society. So, in a larger republic, different interests will have to come together and build coalitions in order to rule. And in a large republic, such a coalition will be more diverse and more moderate in nature than a coalition formed in a small republic. So, essentially, Madison was suggesting that the national government should be at some distance from the people and insulated from their momentary passions because the people did not always do the right thing. Liberty could be threatened just as much by these passions as by a strong national government. So you needed to, desi to design a government that would be uh, uh, to prevent both the politicians and the people uh, from using government for the wrong purposes. Now I want you to understand something here. Both camps, the Federalist camp and the Anti-Federalist camp, were very much concerned about liberty. The question is, which infringement upon liberty is the worst? Having the government trampling upon your rights, the national government trampling upon your rights, and therefore you need to have a weak national government and strong local and state control, okay? Or having a sort of a mob majority, tyranny of the majority, trampling upon the rights of minorities, thus needing a strong national government and a large diverse republic, you see. Both camps were very much concerned about what is going to best preserve liberty, and it related specifically to how strong should the national government be, you see. So on the one hand, one camp believed a strong national government is good to preserve liberty to prevent the majority, the tyranny of the majority in small communities from happening. All right, another camp believed that liberty is best preserved by actually having a weak national government because that strong national government would actually trample upon uh, the powers that belong really appropriately to the state and local governments. Okay, so the Constitution and the founders really kind of dealt with these kinds of issues and the principles in our Constitution do reflect try to achieve a balance between these two, two diverse viewpoints about uh, the, the strong national, about how strong our national government should be. So um, 
on the one hand, we did call for a strong national government, but we did call for separation of powers. We also called for um, a, a, a lot of powers to reside at the state level through our Bill of Rights. In fact, before the Anti-Federalists would sign on and ratify our Constitution, they pushed very strongly for a Bill of Rights, that is, the, which is now embodied in our first ten amendments to the Constitution, and this Bill of Rights will help to ensure individual liberty. So, basically, immediately after the Constitution was accepted by, and ratified by the states, work began quickly on developing amendments to the Constitution that would guarantee the individual liberties. And so the, there were, were originally 12 amendments, but the 10 were approved by 1791 that became part of our Constitution. Now, the thing I wanted to suggest to you here is this, is that the, these Bill of Rights, these first 10 amendments to our Constitution, were specifically designed to help buttress the power of the state governments by doing two things. One, by limiting what the federal government could do. The federal government had to guarantee certain freedoms of speech and freedoms of uh, the press and freedoms of expression, uh, freedoms of religion, these kinds of things. Limiting the power of the national government and at the same time, including within that, the Tenth Amendment. We'll talk about this a little bit later in, in more detail, but the, the Tenth Amendment is known as the Reserve Powers Clause, which basically helps to ensure that the states have plenty of power and authority in this new system of government. Okay, so, but I want you to understand, in a lot of ways, the Constitution was created, and, and through the, the debates that were going back and forth to create a compromise to help ensure that on the one hand, again, the $64 million of question, how do you have a national government so strong but not too strong? And that's, this is the attempt that they tried to create at, at developing, you know, at answering that $64 million question, and that is, a strong national government, but at the same time one where uh, rights of the states and local governments would be secured as well. So, let's talk about some of these provisions in the Constitution as they, as they relate to, to these, these debates and some other aspects of the Constitution um, beyond that too. Um, when we talk about some, some various uh, components within our Constitution, immediately one of the first things that we come up with and need to talk about is something called delegated powers. And this is contained in Article 1, Section 8. And by the way, let me also st step back for a minute just to show you how our Constitution is constructed. Article 1 basically is, deals specifically with the legislature, and that is the Congress. Article 2 talks about the presidency, deals with the presidency. Article 3 deals with the uh, judicial, judicial branch, and specifically the Supreme Court. Now, in Article 1, Section 8, these, there are something contained in that called delegated powers. These are powers explicitly given to Congress. Okay, the book, many, many texts refers to these as enumerated powers. But these are powers that Congress has, okay? And these are powers, for example, the power to tax, the power to borrow money, the power to regulate interstate commerce, to coin money, to declare war. These are powers that you did not see in the Articles of Confederation. These are powers now given to our national government. These are called delegated powers. We also have something called concurrent powers, and this is a principle in the, in the Constitution that basically says these are powers that are shared by both the, the national and state governments. So, for example, to impose and collect taxes is a concurrent power. Uh, to determine criminal, criminal behavior and set forth punishments uh, would be a, considered a concurrent power. Uh, but states, on the other hand, do not have the right to do other things such as coin money or declare war. <clears throat> now besides uh, delegated powers and concurrent powers, we also have this idea I was talking about just a minute ago, reserved powers. This is embodied in the Tenth Amendment. And essentially what the Tenth Amendment says is that all powers that are not expressly denied to the states or given to the national government belongs to the states. You could say, for example, education could be a reserve power, although the federal government certainly does play a role in education policy as well, but the states have the primary role in terms of education. But the argument behind this and the, and the reserve powers is that this in a lot of ways, if you think about how it's, how it's written, all powers that are not expressly denied or given to the national government belong to the states. Well, that in a lot of ways is like a blank check and it's an open-ended kind of idea that helps to ensure that the states have plenty of power. It's not all the power swallowed up at the national level, but there's plenty of power reserved 
uh, to the states. And again, that's part of this idea of federalism, that we're also, we're not, we're going to create a government uh, that where authority exists at both the national level and the states, and plenty of power is going to be reserved to the states. Now, besides delegated powers, uh, concurrent powers, reserved powers, there's also something very important that flows from that very first power, delegated powers, and this is called implied powers. In fact, it comes from the very same section as delegated powers, from Article 1, Section 8. And this is something called the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution. And what it basically says is that Congress has the right to make all laws necessary and proper in order to carry out its constitutional responsibilities or in order to carry out its delegated powers. So this clause established implied powers and, and basically what this has allowed Congress to do is to go beyond those powers specifically listed in the Constitution. In other words, if I have the, the right to collect taxes, all right, then what kind of powers do I need to collect taxes? Can I pass a law, can Congress pass a law, for example, to create the Internal Revenue Service? Well, will you see anything in the Constitution about the Internal Revenue Service? No. But this would be the idea of an implied power. Congress has the right to create the Internal Revenue Service as part of its constitutional responsibility to collect taxes. All right. What about in terms of uh, crea you know, instituting a draft, uh, a military draft? Does Congress have the right to institute a draft? Well, according to the same idea, you will not see anything about a draft in the Constitution. But, on the other hand, in order to raise an army or a navy, to maintain a militia, Congress could say that it has the right to institute a draft in, as an implied power in order to carry out its delegated powers. And what we have seen, especially in terms of the right to uh, uh, establish commerce, control commerce, to regulate commerce, there have been a lot of places over time, in a lot of ways, in which uh, over time Congress has become much more powerful and by implication the national government has become much more powerful because of this implied powers clause. The Founding Fathers may not have realized this, but over time um, the Supreme Court affirmed over and over again the right of the Congress and then by implication the national government to engage in a lot more things that may, than that was originally envisioned by the Founding Fathers uh, as part of implied powers, as part of its right to do things to regulate commerce, for example. And in fact, one of the most important court cases that I should mention is uh, McCulloch versus Maryland, which was in 1819. And in this ca court case, the Supreme Court affirmed the constitutionality of implied powers. Um, what this did, and it, it was a couple of different things it did, but let me, let me focus specifically on the implied powers. The issue at hand was, can Congress establish a national bank? If Congress has the right to coin money and to regulate commerce, does it have the right to establish a national bank as part of this? And there are many people like Alexander Hamilton who believe that we ought to have basically have a national bank, a bank of the United States, in order to help get our economy on a sound footing. Now, this idea of a bank was not mentioned specifically in the Constitution but it could be considered as part of the implied powers to regulate commerce, to borrow money, and collect taxes. And so essentially what this was, was that, con that the Supreme Court uh, established, in this case, a, um, the right of, the, of Congress to establish a national bank using its implied powers. So it affirmed the supremacy of implied powers. Now, Interestingly, I should say, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the second part of this court case, I'll go ahead and talk about this too. Uh, this bank was established and a branch of this bank was located in Maryland. And the question was, was does Maryland have the right to tax this bank because this bank is on Maryland soil? And again, this case went to, the, to, to court and the Supreme Court basically cited with Congress. It said, first of all, that Congress had the right to establish a bank, um, and, at this, and, and at the same time, it also said that Maryland did not have the right to tax this bank. So basically, what this court case did in a one-two punch was, on the one hand, it was a broad interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause. It greatly expanded the potential power and authority of the national government to do a lot of things uh, 
And also, it set up the supremacy of the national government over the states because it said that the states could not tax an entity of the national government. So, in, in, it was a very important court case uh, in, along both of those lines in terms of affirming uh, not only the supremacy of the national government over the states, but also in terms of the legitimacy of, impl of using implied powers. Now, there were some other prohibitions that were placed upon the national government uh, at the time, too. And, and one was Article 1, Section 9, which basically says that Congress could not suspend the privilege of a writ of habeas corpus. And basically, all this means is that if you are arrested, this is a mechanism to protect you. Habeas corpus is a mechanism to protect you because it forces the government, in this case the police, to, to bring you before a judge to determine if you are being legally detained. In other words, it's designed to prevent you from being arrested and detained arbitrarily. Okay? And that was one of the prohibitions placed upon Congress or the national government. Also, the Constitution prevents the government from passing something called a bill of attainder. And basically, this is an act by Congress that declares you guilty of a crime and sets forth a punishment without benefit of a formal trial. It says that Congress cannot, cannot do this. And then a third thing is that the Congress cannot, the, the, the Constitution says, uh, prohibits government, and says the Congress cannot pass something called an ex post facto law. An, act, an ex post facto law is basically, an, it makes an act, it's a law that makes an action criminal, even though at the time it was, it was performed, it was legal. All right, so basically the idea is that it makes something legal that's retroactively illegal, and it cannot do this. Congress cannot pass an ex post facto law. Okay. A couple of other important provisions of the Constitution besides these. Uh, there's something in Article 4 called the Full Faith and Credit Clause. Article 4 basically requires each state to give full faith and credit to the acts, the records, uh, the deeds, the, ju the judicial proceedings of every other state. So, for example, a divorce granted in Missouri must be honored in Arkansas. Now, interestingly, a contemporary controversy uh, dealing with full faith and credit uh, concerns uh, gay marriage. Several states, including Massachusetts and Iowa, have begun to allow gay marriage. Uh, does the full faith and credit clause therefore mean that a gay married couple who moved to Missouri would be considered legally married in Missouri? Well, what has happened is that several states have passed laws that allowed them to not recognize such marriages. And then moreover, at the federal level, Congress has passed something in 1996 called the Defense of Marriage Act, and this act allowed each state to make its own laws related to the issue of gay marriage. Um, but it also allowed other states to avoid honoring such legal unions um, that were performed in another state. So it'll be interesting to see whether someone challenges the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act to see whether or not it violates the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. Another important issue besides the full faith and credit clause is something called the Privileges and Immunity I, I'm sorry, the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution. This is the idea that states are required to grant the same privileges to citizens of other states, uh, the privileges that they grant to citizens of their own state. Okay, so for example, if Missouri passes a law that allows motorcyclists to ride without a helmet, for example, then someone from Nebraska is, is riding a motorcycle in Missouri without a helmet, that person should be also able to ride you know, w without a helmet too. In other words, they have the same privileges as someone in Missouri does. Okay, so regardless of what the law in Nebraska says, you have to have your helmet on or not, if they're in Missouri, they can follow Missouri laws and, and Missouri needs to recognize that this person, even though they're from Nebraska, they have the right to, to have the same privileges and immunities in Missouri for, under Missouri law. Another example is drinking age and crossing over to one state with a lower age limit. Um, you know, if, if your you know, drinking laws in one state might be 18, uh, and most states are actually 21, but uh, that would be an issue where uh, you, if one state's 21, but this state allows it to be 18, you could come over. And at one point in time, we had some of that, uh, where people would come in into another state to drink or purchase alcohol, they'd be allowed to do so because they were now in a state that allowed these kinds of things. But all that relates to the idea of the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Now, um, let's talk about changing the Constitution. This is also pretty interesting, too. 
the Constitution is very, very difficult to change. Um, over the past 200 years, over 10,000 times that we attempted to change the Constitution, there have been over 10,000 amendments proposed to the Constitution, and yet only 27 amendments have actually made it into, you know, to reality, into our, law, into our Constitution. Uh, and really, if you think about this, only, the, only 17, because uh, you know, our first 10 amendments were adopted by 1791. So since 1791, we've only had 17 amendments make it into our Constitution since then. Um, the last amendment that we had was adopted in 1992, and basically this dealt with pay raises for members of Congress. It prohibited Congress from raising its own pay in the same session. In other words, a pay raise could not take effect until the next congressional session convened. And congressional sessions last every two years, so until the next session began, if, and they follow congressional elections, then all of the House of Representatives, for example, go, go up for election every two years. And so until the next session of Congress convened, um, could that pay raise take place. And the text will show you uh, how, how you can amend the Constitution. And the most traditional method is to amend the Constitution, it requires a two-thirds vote in both houses in Congress. It has to pass the Senate by two-thirds and the House by two-thirds, and then it'll go on to the states for approval, and it has to be approved in three-fourths uh, by the states, and, and this typically is done by the state legislatures, but three-fourths of all the state legis legislatures, which is, which is 38 states, have to uh, ratify uh, the uh, proposed amendment before it can take effect. Now, what does that tell us? Well, if you look at statistics and the odds of, of some amending the Constitution, it's very, very slim. And today, there have been several proposed amendments, things like prayer in public schools, a ban on abortion. The likelihood of these things passing is very small indeed. Um, banning gay marriage, okay, for example, too. The, uh, and, and if you, the, the point here is that it's very, very difficult to amend the Constitution. At one point in time, they're talking about a, a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And as our deficits get out of whack here, you may see other further calls for, banning, for, for proposing um, a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. But in any case, the point I want to share with you is this. If you ever hear a politician say, vote for me because I'm going to propose a constitutional amendment to allow prayer in schools or to allow, uh, to, to ban abortion, whatever it may be, just realize that that, uh, that politician is either fairly naive because he or she does not understand the likelihood of it getting done, or that politician is assuming that you are fairly naive because you don't understand the fact that the likelihood of it getting done is very good. The point is, a lot of politicians will use this as, as a ploy to garner, vo garner, garner votes, but it really is very meaningless because anytime they say, I'm going to propose a constitutional amendment, they may propose the amendment, but it will never see the light of day the odds are far against it ever happening. So if you ever hear, hear a politician saying to you, vote for me because I'm going to uh, propose an amendment to do this or to do, to, or to do that, recognize the fact that you know, it's not going to happen. Now, a couple of other points I want to talk to you about in terms of the Constitution. Uh, first of all, the text talks a lot about how the Constitution has been changed to reflect the needs, the changing needs of our society over time. Uh, and that, that change has basically occurred through two areas, through constitutional, the amendment process, and also through interpretation of Supreme Court cases. And a lot of this actually gets into the debate about how we should interpret the Constitution. One camp believes, for example, that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that should be interpreted in light of our modern times in light of the nuances and complexities of our society today. And so th the way we should do, do this is to read into the Constitution, to say what did the founders mean by this and what has it come to mean over time? And that's one school of thought, that we should have sort of a broad, loose interpretation of the Constitution. And uh, because the Constitution is a living, breathing document that reflects changing times and changing needs of our society. Um, a second perspective is, is the idea of saying, no, no, we should really go to the original intent of our founding fathers. Let's look, it's, it's best to interpret the Constitution even today from the perspective of the signers of this document, the original signers. Going back to the original intent, that's the way we ought to look at the Constitution.
And, and um, in this case, this would call for what you would, you would say a strict interpretation, a strict construction of the Constitution. And in a lot of ways, um, this goes into some political debates about uh, judges. And a lot of people say that people who adopt more of this loose interpretation of the Constitution are, are have been criticized as being, quote, activist judges. And they're not following congressional intent, or I'm sorry, the original intent of the Founding Fathers. Um, and they should instead stick to basically what does the Constitution say and kind of limit, limit what the Constitution and its amendments say to, to speak to what today's issues in society are. Now, another important point I want to suggest to you that relates to this, is, and that is how flawless, how perfect is our Constitution? Do you think the Constitution is a perfect document? Was it perfect the day it was signed or, or not? And they, there are people that are out there who look at our Constitution with almost a sense of reverence. It's the world o world's oldest written Constitution. It, uh, we've had it for over 200 years. It has withstood the test of time. It reflects the profound wisdom of our founding fathers. Uh, other people look at this as saying that's a very simplistic view of the Constitution. And they use arguments like this. If you think our Constitution is perfect or was perfect from the time it was, was born, uh, consider just the idea of democracy um, as it's reflected in our Constitution. Was our, our Constitution, how democratic was our Constitution when it was first adopted? This is the argument that they use. And let's, let's look at some points about it from that perspective. When our Constitution was first adopted, was slavery allowed to flourish? And yes, the answer was, was uh, it, it was. And the slavery was embodied in our Constitution uh, when it was first adopted. And it took the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to, and the Civil War to end, end the practice of slavery. And so um, until it was amended, slavery was considered and embodied in, in the principles of our Constitution. What about this in terms of democracy? Voting qualifications. Voting qualifications were left to the states. And what this basically meant is that people without property, if you, were, if you did not have property, um, if you happened to be female, and certainly if you were African Americans, you were denied the right to vote. Uh, in fact, women, let's just use as an example, women were not given the right to vote across the nation until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Now think about that. All the way up to about the, to the early 1900s, women did not have the right to vote. White women did not have the right to vote, and, or, or black women too, for that matter, African-American women, women. And so the point here is that, uh, you know, the, uh, how democratic is the Constitution when there are lots of people in our society, African-Americans and, and females, who were not given the right to vote? Um, it's interesting that now some states, like Wyoming, uh, did allow women the right to vote earlier, like in the 1800s, 1880s, women were given the right to vote in Wyoming as early as back then. But all across the nation, it was not actually ratified in terms of our constitutional amendment until 1920. Um, let's look in terms of how, as I mentioned earlier, how senators were selected. Senators were basically elected by state legislatures, not by the people. Um, and that did not occur until the, uh, 1917, I believe. So, so senators were elected by state legislatures and instead of directly by the people. And of course, we set up the Electoral College as a way of electing the president, providing an indirect way of electing the president. And so um, all of this, in some respects, seemed to reflect a bit of a distrust of the people. We wanted democracy, but we didn't want too much democracy because you really could not trust the common person. And the point here, as I just want to say, is that, again, some of the elements, that, some of the points we were talking about here in terms of enfranchisement of people who have the right to vote is a reflection that it really took several constitutional amendments to, to change the nature of democracy and, and who was allowed to even have the right to vote. And again, some people suggest, therefore, that our Constitution uh, wasn't a perfect document when we first created it, but at the same time, over time, through the amendment process and through other parts of our history, such as the Civil War, we were finally able to create and craft a government that the Constitution was based upon that reflected those original ideals in the Constitution, such as all men and by implication all people are created equal. Now, um, it's also a good idea to talk about, since we're talking about the Constitution, this is also a good idea to talk a little bit about uh, Missouri's Constitution. Um, as part of our training and 
discussion of topics in Political Science 101, we're not only talking about the national government, but we're also going to be talking about Missouri government. So when we talk about, for example, the U.S. Congress, we'll talk about the Missouri legislature, the U.S. president, we'll talk about the governor and the governor's powers, um, the, U the Supreme Court, we'll talk about the Missouri's court system, and of course the U.S. Constitution, let's talk about Missouri's uh, Constitution. Now, in a lot of ways, and what I want to do is talk about some different ways in which our Constitution parallels and is somewhat different from the U.S. Constitution, all right? Now, in one of the ways in which we parallel the U.S. Constitution, uh, first of all, this is this idea. Why do we need a state constitution? Well, why do we use, have a U.S. Constitution? We have, uh, it's similar to the U.S. Constitution, we wanted to make sure that the rights, privileges, and liberties of citizens and the different levels of governments are spelled out in, in, in clear detail. State rights and privileges are spelled out in relationship to the national U.S. Constitution. And so the same kind of idea takes place in terms of the relationship between our state government and the people and, and also lower governments such as city governments and county governments. And remember, think about this, because of the Reserve Powers Clause, the states have a lot of power. So you need to have a set of rules such as when to hold elections, the number of representatives and requirements of our legislatures and those things are embodied in our Missouri Constitution. So in other words, it spells out the relationships among and between the state and county and local governments. Uh, that's not provided for in the U.S. Constitution uh, at, the, lo at the, the local level here. So we have a Missouri Constitution to provide these kinds of provisions here. Uh, it says basically the Missouri Constitution says what functions will the state be responsible for and what functions counties and cities will be primarily responsible for. Now, uh, the period of, of uh, Missouri's history, basically going back to 1820, the founding of our, our when our state was first created, uh, we've had essentially four uh, basic constitutions over that period of time. Our first constitution was established in 1820. Its distinguishing characteristic was it made clear who a citizen was. If you were African American, you were not allowed to, you were not a citizen, you were not allowed to participate in the political process, you were not allowed to vote. Um, they were not considered citizens of the state and they were therefore denied the right to vote. Now, uh, we had the Civil War in 1865, therefore we adopted a new state constitution which basically gave African Americans the right to vote and it established citizenship for African Americans. Interestingly enough, in the 1865 constitution, it took away, however, citizenship from any Missouri citizen who had sided with the Confederacy. If you had either fought for the South or sympathetic to the Confederacy, um, you were denied uh, the right to be a citizen of Missouri and denied the right to vote. This was known as the ironclad oath and you had to take an oath that you were not sympathetic to the Confederacy in order to be a Missouri citizen. Now, the next constitution we had and adopted was in 1875. And this distinguishing characteristic about the 1875 constitution was that it gave the governor more powers. It strengthened the powers of the governor, it extended his term, and in particular, it gave him something called the line item veto. And that's what really expanded his power more than anything else. The line item veto basically is this. And most state governors have this line item veto power today. Um, the idea is that when the governor is looking at a bill, the bill is on his or her desk, and the, and the governor sees that, the governor, uh, instead of, have, instead of up, uh, voting up or down the entire bill, in other words, vetoing the entire bill, or approving the entire bill, the governor instead can actually uh, veto certain provisions of that bill. And so there might be some provisions of a bill that have certain programs or have certain types of money, monetary implications that might be very, very expensive and the governor could actually just simply veto out those portions of the bill. And the reason why most governors across the United States today have a line item veto is because most state constitutions require the respective states to balance their budgets. And so because of this, the line item veto is used by governors extensively on line item or vetoing specific provisions that are, might be very, very expensive. And so it's a means to help balance the budget and certain provisions do that. But that also does give the, the, the president, um, I'm sorry, the governor, 
a lot of power by having the line item veto. The U.S. president does not have the line item veto power. For a brief moment in time, Bill Clinton, when he was president, had that line item veto power, but it was declared at the national level unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about that when we talk about the presidency. But in any case, the governor does have the power of the line item veto. Now, and that was given to the governor back in 1875. The last constitution we adopted was the one that we currently have, and this has been in, it was in 1945. That's our main constitution today. Um, the interesting thing about the constitution today is that since 1945, our constitution has been amended over 80 times, I believe 82 times since 1945. And um, what's a reason to explain this is why, why is it that on the one hand we've amended it 82 times since 1945, but yet the U.S. Constitution has only been technically amended 17 times since 1791? Well, the reason why, and this is a very important point that distinguishes the Missouri Constitution from the U.S. Constitution, is that obviously it's much easier to amend the Missouri Constitution. Instead of having, you know, like, like in the U.S. level, having a two-thirds vote of both houses of the legislature and sending it on to three-fourths of the states, or in this case, three-fourths of the counties for, for approval, instead, the people simply have it on the ballot, and by a simple majority vote on the ballot, an amendment will, 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 will be approved and, and, and modify our, our Constitution. So the people across Missouri simply uh, are, 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 uh, approve amendments to our Constitution, and it's done by a simple majority vote on the ballot. All right? And that's an important way in which the Missouri Constitution differs for the US, from the U.S. Constitution and helps to explain why we have so many more amendments to our Constitution than our U.S. Constitution. Okay? Now, in our next session, um, we're going to be moving in and talking about federalism. We're going to, we'll, we'll be exploring in detail the, the, the topic of federalism. That gets into the relationship between the national government and the states. And this gets into one of those fundamental questions that I mentioned during our first session about where should government authority be vested? How much power should the federal government have? How much power should the states have? What kinds of functions and activities belong best at the, le at the national level? and what kinds of functions and activities are best performed by the states. Uh, which ones should have a leading role? So I hope you uh, enjoyed this discussion about the Constitution. This is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.